Part Seven, Chapter Seven, of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume Two, by Edward Tyus Cook, The Nurses' Battle and Health in the Village, eighteen eighty-five to eighteen ninety-three nursing cannot be formulated like engineering it cannot be numbered or registered like population florence nightingale eighteen ninety what can be done for the health of the home without the woman of the home in the west as in the east women are needed as rural health missioners florence nightingale eighteen ninety three the period of miss nightingale's life covered in this chapter includes the year of queen victoria's jubilee which was also what Miss Nightingale used to consider her jubilee year. She fixed her effectual call at February 7, 1837. In 1887, she had thus completed fifty years vowed to service. In August, a month of many memories to her, she looked back over the past and around her in the present, and was in a despondent mood. Miss Nightingale to Mrs. S. Smith, Clayton House, august five eighteen eighty seven dearest aunt may thinking of you always grieved for your suffering hoping that you have still to enjoy in this month thirty-four years ago you lodged me in harley street august twelve and in this month thirty-one years ago you returned me to england from scutari august seven and in this month thirty years ago the first royal commission was finished august seven and since then thirty years of work often cut to pieces but never destroyed god bless you in this month twenty-six years ago sidney herbert died after five years of work for us august two in this month twenty-four years ago the work of the second royal commission india was finished and in this month this year it seems all to have to be done again and in this month this year the work at st thomas's hospital seems all to have to be done again changing matrons after twenty-seven years and in this month this year my powers seem all to have failed and old age set in may the father almighty irresistible for love is irresistible whose work and none others this is conduct it always as he has done while i have misconducted it may he do in us what he would have us do god bless you dearest aunt may as ever your old loving flow and in this month too florence nightingale was to die but nearly a quarter of a century of life was first granted to her and for the greater part of the time she remained in full possession of her faculties though she might be an old lady to young nurses others remarked that she looked wonderfully fresh and youthful for her years if old age had set in her powers had by no means failed and in many directions her work though sometimes sore beset continued to prosper we will take first in our survey her work in the nursing world the change of matrons at st thomas's hospital caused by the retirement of mrs wardroper was hardly such a tragedy as it seemed to miss nightingale mrs wardroper had done her work and there were younger women competent to fill the place mr jowett often begged miss nightingale to remember that there is no necessary man or woman not even as greatly daring he once added yourself but in this case the chief of the nightingale school was not yet retiring and she would still be able to supervise it perhaps even more closely under a new matron for many years miss nightingale continued to maintain the intimate touch with her school that has been described in an earlier chapter seeing the sisters constantly making the personal acquaintance of nurses conferring with their medical instructors reading their diaries and examination papers her heart was even more closely in the work when she secured the appointment as mrs wardroper's successor of her dear friend miss pringle presently however there came what was a heavy blow to miss nightingale miss pringle joined the roman communion and it was necessary that she should retire from the matronship of st thomas's 
the months of unsettlement before the conversion was made were full of grief to miss nightingale indeed her notes and meditations suggest that the loss of her favourite pupil was one of the heaviest griefs of her life but she loved her friend too well for the sorrow to leave any abiding bitterness over and over again in her meditations she wrote down lines from clough's qua cursum ventus miss pringle was succeeded by miss gordon an old pupil of the nightingale school she and miss nightingale speedily became the best of friends and things went on much as before in the school all these changes with the delicate weighing of rival claims and sometimes with the worrying conflict of personal ambitions caused miss nightingale heavy anxiety intensely conscientious acutely sensitive and seeing in every change a great potentiality of good or evil she could not treat such things as mere matters of business there have been prime ministers who could not sleep of nights under the sense of responsibility caused by ecclesiastical preferment and to miss nightingale the selection of a superintendent or a home sister was even as the appointment of a bishop two the movement for district nursing which was always near to miss nightingale's heart and which in conjunction with mr rathbone and others she had done much to promote received considerable extension by the action of queen victoria in eighteen eighty seven the bulk of the sum presented as the women's jubilee gift was devoted by the queen to the nursing the sick poor in their own homes by means of trained nurses she appointed the duke of westminster sir rutherford alcock and sir james paget to be trustees of the fund and to advise upon its administration sir james paget consulted miss nightingale who in several conversations impressed upon him her view that the essential things were the training of nurses for the work and the association of them in homes the lines of the metropolitan district nursing association which had for many years been largely supported by nurses trained in the nightingale school and by grants from the nightingale fund were adopted as the basis of the jubilee institute for nurses and the association presently became affiliated to the institute in an introduction which she contributed in eighteen ninety to a book giving account of these matters miss nightingale struck a warning note the tendency is now to make a formula of nursing a sort of literary expression now no living thing can less lend itself to a formula than nursing nursing has to nurse living bodies and spirits it must be sympathetic it cannot be tested by public examinations though it may be tested by current supervision the royal jubilee institute in some ways advanced miss nightingale's cause but she had misgivings vexilla regis pro deunt yes but of which king was the oriflame which was now beginning to wave above the nursing sisterhood of heavenly fire or of terrestrial tissue we are becoming the fashion miss nightingale was fond of saying we must be on our guard royalty is smiling on us we must have a care such misgivings were speedily to be justified the nursing world was for some years rent in twain by a dispute about royal charters and registration the controversy lasted for seven years eighteen eighty six to ninety three miss nightingale was in the thick of it and during the more critical period of the dispute eighteen ninety one eighteen ninety two it was her main public preoccupation in eighteen eighty six the hospitals association appointed a committee to inquire into the possibility of establishing a general register of nurses the committee violently disagreed in eighteen eighty seven the majority retired and the minority founded the british nurses association with a view to carrying forward a scheme of registration in eighteen eighty eight the hospitals association appointed a second committee which proceeded to collect opinions from the various nurse training schools these schools were for the most part opposed to the idea of a general register 
but there was difference of opinion among leaders alike in the medical profession and in the nursing world i have a terror wrote miss nightingale to mr bonham carter april twenty eighteen eighty nine lest the b n a s and the anti b n a s should form two hostile camps judging one another by that test chiefly or alone this would be disastrous the unionists and the home rulers show us an example of what this is they are two hostile camps dividing families it is like a craze the test for example even of a good doctor or of an acquaintance is to which camp does he belong even a doctor canvassing for an appointment is asked whether he is home ruler or unionist i can remember nothing so distressing since the reform bill which i remember very well when the two sides would not meet each other at dinner i do not know that feeling between the pro-registrationists and the anti-registrationists went to the length of war to the knife and fork but the nurses battle as it was called in the newspapers was hot and prolonged from a fighting point of view the two sides were fairly matched on each side there were eminent doctors the antis had an advantage in that they included the greater number of those who had the longest and closest knowledge of nurse training but the pros had a princess at their head the princess christian had accepted the presidency of the british nurses association and when the time came for applying for a charter it was the princess who petitioned the queen this makes it awkward for us said mr rathbone to miss nightingale and undoubtedly it did there were courtly personages even among miss nightingale's devoted adherents who were inclined to trim and there were other persons who having never perhaps thought out the questions were predisposed to do as the princess did let each man in the battle have such credit as is due for his personal loyalty in any matter of nursing miss nightingale is my pope wrote mr rathbone and i believe in her infallibility nothing can save us he said to miss nightingale herself except your intervention she was not slow to give it suggestions were made by intimate friends sir henry ackland and sir harry verney that she should see the princess christian and endeavour to come to terms and later on in eighteen ninety three when the empress frederick visited miss nightingale they renewed the suggestion but the princess christian had made no overtures she was committed to the particular scheme advocated by the association of which she was president and to miss nightingale opposition to that scheme was a matter of vital principle she threw herself into the fray with an equipment of argumentative resource derived from her unequalled experience and with a passionate conviction inspired by long brooding over a fixed ideal the objects of the british nurses association were to unite all qualified british nurses in membership of a recognized profession to provide for their registration on terms satisfactory to physicians and surgeons as evidence of their having received systematic training to associate them for mutual help and protection and for the advantage in every way of their professional work and with a view to the attainment of these objects to obtain a royal charter incorporating the association and authorizing the formation of a register it was around the second and the fourth of these objects that the principal battle raged the case of the association was prima facie a strong one a register of nurses duly certified as competent would it was argued be a protection against impostors the certification was to be by a board which would insist on a certain standard of professional proficiency three years training in a hospital was suggested as the preliminary test the case on the other side as developed by miss nightingale and her allies was that the apparent advantages of a register were deceptive who was to be protected not the hospitals they protected themselves without any general register by their own methods if any one was to be protected it must be the public but the register would rather mislead than protect them 
the placing of a name on a register would at best only certify that at a certain date the nurse had satisfied the required tests but the date might be long ago and the fact of registration would tell nothing of her subsequent conduct or competence the registration of medwives stood on a different footing from that of nurses for in the former case a certain definite technical skill is of the essence of the matter in the case of nursing character is as much of its essence as any technical qualification as for the three years training in a hospital there were hospitals and hospitals training schools and training schools and who was to guarantee the guarantors the general register would not raise the profession of nursing it would do an injury to the better nurses by putting them on a level with the worse and to the profession by stereotyping a minimum standard the british nurses association had published a preliminary register miss nightingale analyzed it and found that in the case of nurses trained at one hospital the private register of that hospital excluded nearly one-third of those entered on the b n a s register and that another hospital's register included as duly certificated only one-third of those entered on the b n a s register as trained thereat you cannot select the good from the inferior by any test or system of examination but most of all and first of all must their moral qualifications be made to stand preeminent in estimation all this can only be secured by the current supervision tests or examination which they receive in their training school or hospital not by any examination from a foreign body like that proposed by the british nurses association indeed those who come best off in such would probably be the ready and forward not the best nurses the much vexed question of internal or external examination was it will be seen involved in this dispute but to miss nightingale a larger and a more vital issue was at stake it was a conflict between two ideals or rather as she would have said between a high ideal and a material expediency mr jowett though he agreed in her view that nurses cannot be registered and examined any more than mothers was distressed that she was so greatly perturbed over what seemed to him so small a matter it is a comparative trifle he wrote may twenty sixth eighteen ninety two among all the work which you have done and you must not be over anxious to miss nightingale it was not a trifle but a trial a possible parting of the ways it was diverting attention from training homes to examination tests it was sacrificing a high calling to professional advancement there comes a crisis she wrote to mr jowett may in the lives of all social movements rough hew them as you will when the amateur and outward and certifying or registering spirit comes in on the one side and the mercantile or buying and selling spirit on the other this has come in the case of nursing in about thirty years for nursing was born about thirty years ago the present trial is not persecution but fashion and this brings in all sorts of amateur alloy and public life instead of the life of a calling and registering instead of training on the other hand an extra mercantile spirit has come in of forcing up wages regardless of the truism that nursing has been raised from the sink it was not more by training than by making the hospital workhouse infirmary or district home a place of moral and healthful safeguards inspiring a sense of duty and a love of the calling the true way of protecting the public was to extend homes for private nurses on sound lines aided by the nurses training schools and hospitals not by means of a chartered register to encourage nurses to flock to the institutions which gave the easiest certificate at the least trouble of training miss nightingale could not then regard the dispute as a trifle it caused her days and nights of grievous anxiety her meditations are full of despondency and searchings of heart both bitter and self-reproachful 
the princess christian with the best intentions was giving her name to undermine miss nightingale's ideal this could not justly be attributed in blame to the princess the fault must have been with her florence nightingale who had misused her opportunities and had failed to impress her ideal on other minds she was an unprofitable servant but here as in all things the sensitive reproaches of the night watches left no trace of themselves on the work of the day or rather they left their trace in greater activity and devotion it was in eighteen eighty nine that the occasion came for resolute action the british nurses association announced their intention of applying for a charter and proceeded to enlist public support miss nightingale set to work on the other side she made the acquaintance at this time of miss lux then as now nineteen thirteen the matron of the london hospital who was strongly opposed to the idea of registration the acquaintance speedily ripened into friendship and henceforth miss nightingale was looked to for support and sympathy by the matron of the london hardly less than by her of st thomas's other nurse training schools came into line and a manifesto was issued announcing their intention to oppose any petition for a charter there was desultory skirmishing for some time between the registrationists and anti-registrationists there was a lively polemic in the newspapers there were as many fly-sheets and pamphlets as if it were a theological dispute in a university in eighteen ninety one the british nurses association applied to the board of trade to be registered as a public company without the addition of the word limited to its name the memorandum and proposed articles of association were duly filed and the foremost place was again given among the declared objects to a register of trained nurses and the power to determine from time to time the test for registration miss nightingale and her allies took up the challenge through sir harry verney she approached the president of the board of trade sir michael hicks beach with a statement of the case against the association a counter petition was presented and after full consideration the board refused the application the first engagement had thus resulted in a victory for miss nightingale in the same year there was a committee of the house of lords to inquire into the london hospitals mr rathbone coached by miss nightingale gave evidence on the question of the registration of nurses and the committee reported against it a second victory but the registrationists now brought up their most formidable reserves permission was obtained from the sovereign to use the title royal thus strengthened by favour in the highest quarter the royal british nurses association petitioned the queen for a royal charter the petition was referred in the usual course to a special committee of the privy council and the two sides marshalled their forces a campaign fund was raised by the anti-registrationists miss nightingale appealed privately to the lord president of the council and wrote various letters memoranda statements she enlisted support from the medical profession her old pupils now in charge of nurse training schools throughout the country rallied round her two petitions of special weight were presented to the privy council against the charter one was from the council of the nightingale fund the body which had been the pioneer in promoting the training of nurses the other was the petition of executive officers matrons lady superintendents and principal assistants of the london and provincial hospitals and nurse training schools and of members of the medical profession and ladies directly connected with nursing and the training of nurses the list of signatures which occupies twenty-three folio pages was headed by florence nightingale in the preparation of these documents miss nightingale had a large share though much of the work especially in the instruction of the lawyers in consultations and so forth was done by mr bonham carter the committee of the privy council sat in november eighteen ninety two to hear the case 
of the first day's proceedings miss nightingale wrote an account in which as will be seen she did not let the registrationist dogs have the better of it but which betrays at the same time serious anxiety about the result miss nightingale to sir harry verney ten south street november twenty two eighteen ninety two yesterday was the first day of the privy council trial we had to change our senior counsel at the last moment because mr finlay was engaged on an election committee and our previous four days were therefore as you may suppose very busy we were fortunate enough to have sir richard webster sir horace davy opened the ball on behalf of princess christian his speech was dull and contained only the commonplaces we have heard for a year in favour of the royal charter the judges were lord ripon who only stayed half the time lord monson and two law lords lord hannon and lord hobhouse they appeared to have been chosen as knowing nothing of the matter and as not having been on the lord's committee on hospitals our side sir richard webster followed with a masterly speech masterly from being that of a shrewd man of sense without rhetoric and from his splendid getting up of our case at short notice he put very strongly our contention that character unregisterable rather than technical training makes the nurse and other of our points the judges adjourned till monday in the middle of his speech where he was saying as we do what is the use of saying that a nurse has had three years training at such a hospital how can you certify the hospital he will resume this subject and others on monday the judges asked all the questions not to the point that you can fancy men perfectly ignorant of the subject to ask and which we have answered over and over again sir richard webster said to bonham carter at the end of yesterday the judges are dead against us the charter pledges itself to admit on the register only nurses of three years hospital training which the judges pronounced could do no harm but it provides for itself what may put into its hands the whole control of what constitutes training is it not wonderful these men do not see this well we are in god's hands brother not in theirs the privy councils in all my strange life through which god has guided me so faithfully oh that i had been as faithful to him as he to me this is the strangest episode of all to see a number of doctors of the highest eminence giving their names to what they know nothing at all about sir james paget told me himself that the names were asked for at a court ball following each other like a flock of sheep to see their council of registration made up of sirs only one of whom knows anything about nurse training sir james paget himself asked me why can't nurses lodge out as students do to see these able good and shrewd men ignoring that such a thing is sure to fall into a clique they have let princess christian fall into such an one already she is made a tool of by two or three people lift up your heads ye gates and the king of glory shall come in who is the king of glory the lord strong in battle o god of battle steel thy soldiers hearts against happy-go-luckiness against courtiership fashion and mere money-making on the part of the nurses and their societies p s this trial will cost us seven hundred pounds at least the committee took time to consider their advice to her majesty in may eighteen ninety three the decision was announced the committee advised her majesty in council to grant a charter in accordance with a draft revised by them on june sixth the charter was granted each side claimed the victory the nursing record june fifteen an organ of the registrationists claimed that they had won all and even more than all that they asked and declared proudly that henceforth members of the royal chartered association will hold a higher position than any others the hospital on the other side argued that all this was ill-founded but if the british nurses wanted to be congratulated on nothing we are willing to congratulate them june twenty four the fight before the privy council now became a fight in the press on the meaning of the verdict the anti-registrationists headed by miss nightingale and the duke of westminster put their interpretation in a quiet letter to the times july three 
which the royal british nurses association hotly denounced as untrue in fact and injurious in intention july six the fact was that the lords of the council had steered a middle course they granted the charter but in it for the words the maintenance of a list or register of nurses showing as to each nurse registered etc they substituted the words the maintenance of a list of persons who may have applied to have their names entered therein as nurses etc there was nothing in the charter which gave any nurse the right to call herself chartered or registered what the promoters hoped we need not discuss what the opponents feared was a charter in such terms as would give the corporation an authoritative and perhaps ultimately an exclusive right to register nurses and thereby would give it also indirect control over nurse training no such charter was obtained and in this sense the opposition of miss nightingale and her friends had prevailed the controversy is not dead but so far her view has continued to prevail and the official registration of nurses is still a pious hope to its supporters a heresy to its opponents miss nightingale greatly deplored the feud but sought to bring good out of evil forty years hence she wrote to mr rathbone february twenty sixth eighteen ninety one such a scheme might not be preposterous provided the intermediate time be diligently and successfully employed in levelling up that is in making all nurses at least equal to the best trained nurses of this day and in levelling up training schools in like manner great good may be done she wrote to mr jowett may eighteen ninety two by rousing our side to an increased earnestness about one providing homes for nurses while engaged in their work of nursing and two full private hospital registers tracing the careers of nurses trained by them there were no years in which miss nightingale herself gave more thought and trouble than in eighteen ninety one through three to personal care for the affairs of the nightingale school in a paper which miss nightingale was invited to contribute to a congress on women's work held at chicago in eighteen ninety three she treated the whole subject of nursing this paper embodies in a methodical form her characteristic views and in it she takes occasion in several places to touch obliquely upon the controversy described in preceding pages a new art and a new science has been created since and within the last forty years and with it a new profession so they say we say calling she dwells on the conditions necessary to make a good training school for nurses she dilates upon the dangers to which nursing is subject these are fashion on the one side and a consequent want of earnestness mere money-getting on the other side and a mechanical view of nursing can it be possible that a testimonial or certificate of three years so-called training or service from a hospital any hospital with a certain number of beds can be accepted as sufficient to certify a nurse for a place in a public register as well might we not take a certificate from any garden of a certain number of acres that plants are certified valuable if they have been three years in the garden then there was imminent danger of stereotyping instead of progressing no system can endure that does not march objects of registration not capable of being gained by a public register the whole paper is written with a good deal of gusto the volume in which it appeared was dedicated to princess christian in the following year miss nightingale had some correspondence with the princess who as president of the royal british nurses association had made a scheme for enrolling a war nursing reserve through the hospitals and had written to consult miss nightingale about it the hospital sisters were according to this scheme to be placed in subordination to the army sisters nurses with the larger experience under those with the smaller this seemed to miss nightingale a mistake and she noted other details in which the scheme appeared to her inadequately considered she pointed these things out faithfully to the princess but the correspondence on both sides was cordial 
the letters from the princess made miss nightingale exclaim how gracefully royalty can do things and on her part she desired to be conciliatory we should i think be earnestly anxious she wrote to do what we can for princess christian as she holds out the flag of truce in order to put an end as far as we can to all this bickering which does such harm to the cause there were thoughts in miss nightingale's mind throughout this controversy still deeper than any which have yet been noticed she had an esoteric conception of nursing which made her regard the view of it as a registrable business in the light almost of sacrilege a profession so they say we say calling and not only a calling but a form through which religious satisfaction might be found her view comes out in a letter which she wrote to mr joward in eighteen eighty nine in the course of a discussion with him upon the necessity of external forms for the religious life you say that mystical or spiritual religion is not enough for most people without outward form and i may say i can never remember a time when it was not the question of my life not so much for myself as for others for myself the mystical or spiritual religion as laid down by st john's gospel however imperfectly i have lived up to it was and is enough but the two thoughts which god has given me all my whole life have been first to infuse the mystical religion into the forms of others always thinking they would show it forth much better than i especially among women to make them the handmaids of the lord secondly to give them an organization for their activity in which they could be trained to be the handmaids of the lord training for women was then unknown unwished for and is the discovery of the last thirty years one could have taken up the school education of the poor but one was specially called then to hospitals and nursing both sanitation and nursing proper this was then the organization which we had to begin with to attract respectable women and give religious women a form for their activity when very many years ago i planned a future my one idea was not organizing a hospital but organizing a religion now handmaids of the lord cannot be certified by external examiners nor can a religious service be guaranteed by registers does this view of the matter seem a little transcendental it was in accord at any rate with another of miss nightingale's fundamental doctrines which in its application to the controversy had a severely practical force nursing she held is a progressive art in which to stand still is to go back no note is more often struck in her addresses to nurses she held as may already have been gathered from the foregoing summary of her case that the registrationists consciously or unconsciously had lost hold of that essential truth about nursing it was right that precautions should be taken against impostors and that the fullest inquiry should be made miss nightingale's objection was not to the precautions but to their misleading nature not to the tests but to their inadequacy the only real and sufficient guarantee in the case of an art in which the training both technical and moral is a continuous process was she held that the public should be able to obtain a recent recommendation of the nurse who was to be passed on from one doctor hospital or superintendent to another with something of the same elaborate record of work and character that she herself required in the case of nightingale probationers and nurses End of the nurses battle and health in the village one and two part seven chapter seven of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook the nurse's battle and health in the village continued parts three four five six and seven three the fate of miss nightingale's work in the cause of public health both in india and at home 
was chequered during these years even as was that in the cause of trained nursing but here again substantial advance was made in several directions there was once a secretary of state who entered the india office possessed by a strong and personal interest in sanitation there was some excitement in the office there were one or two men around the minister who heartily approved there were more who shook their heads the minister must have been listening they thought directly or indirectly to a certain lady's beautiful nonsense he was too impressionable he was anxious to do things in spite of the claims of economy he was too much in a hurry they took him in hand in order to quiet him down they thought to have succeeded in making him satisfied to leave things as they were the other side became conscious of a change it is essential wrote one of them to a certain lady that you should see him at once the lady who was the hope of one side and the fear of the other was miss nightingale the minister need not be identified for these things though true also of a particular case and time are here given as a general allegory for thirty years and more through all changes and chances in the political world miss nightingale was a permanent force importuning indoctrinating inspiring in the interests of better sanitary administration for some time after the early months of eighteen eighty five the political situation was very unsettled the government formed by lord salisbury after the defeat of mr gladstone in june was only a cabinet of caretakers and it was not worth miss nightingale's while to approach any of them besides she instinctively recognized the secretary of state for india as a hopeless subject she was right lord randolph churchill was all against lord ripon and all for economy when lord salisbury's government was in turn overthrown after the general election in december miss nightingale through various channels approached mr gladstone and begged him to send lord ripon to the india office he returned polite but evasive answers and so controversial an appointment was obviously improbable lord ripon went to the admiralty the excitement of the first home rule bill followed the government was defeated another general election was necessary and all was in confusion dr sutherland anxious to retire from the public service for he was now nearly eighty was pressing miss nightingale to devise measures for safeguarding his department after he was gone she pressed him to stay on yet a while during the political earthquakes of the last eight months still continuing no permanent interest can be expected she wrote to him july twenty eighteen eighty six in those who are so little permanent the subject excruciates me lord ripon who came to see her ten days later thought that the times were unpropitious generally for good causes an opinion which defeated ministers are apt to hold there are waves in these matters he said the thing is to come in upon the crest of the waves you would have done nothing for the army and sanitation if it had not been for the crash in the crimea now the wave is against india miss nightingale however did not allow herself to be tempted into inactivity by this wave theory for the moment indeed there was nothing to be done with ministers at home but she had not been neglectful of cultivating relations with anglo-indians and indians in positions of influence in eighteen eighty five she had added sir neville chamberlain and sir peter lumsden to her list of anglo-indian acquaintances lord Rie had called upon her march eighteen eighty five before leaving to take up the governorship of bombay and she corresponded with him frequently on sanitary subjects in october lord roberts came before going out to india as commander-in-chief miss nightingale took great pains with this interview dr sutherland 
having furnished her in advance with an admirable synopsis of what might still be done to improve the health and welfare of the troops lord roberts's command was fruitful of some reforms in which miss nightingale had been a pioneer he established a club or institute in every british regiment and battery in india he closed canteens he opened coffee stalls he established an army temperance association no letter which miss nightingale received in her jubilee year can have pleased her more than one which the commander-in-chief in india sent her from simla on august sixth in this letter lord roberts told her that the government of india had sanctioned the employment of female nurses in the military hospitals a commencement was to be made at the two large military centres of umballa and rawalpindi and eighteen nurses with lady superintendents in each case were to be sent out from england at once the selection of nurses was entrusted to surgeon-general arthur payne who in the following month had several interviews with miss nightingale thus after twenty-two years was the scheme which she had put before sir john lawrence brought to fruition miss nightingale saw the superintendents before they went out and letters from them were now added to the pile of those which she received from hospitals throughout the world reporting progress or asking advice miss c g loach wrote from wawalpindi april twelfth eighteen eighty eight describing how she had found that as miss nightingale always said the education of the orderlies was the most important thing for the nurses to do the official introduction of female nursing into the indian military hospitals was by no means the only satisfaction which miss nightingale received during lord dufferin's viceroyalty he had declared himself ignorant of indian sanitary things but had promised to learn and not only was he as good as his word but lady dufferin was keenly interested also she founded the national association for supplying medical aid to the women of india miss nightingale had long been interested in the subject and lady dufferin consulted her at every stage one of the first things needful lady dufferin had written september nineteenth eighteen eighty five was a supply of sanitary tracts in using the word tract i am thinking of some little books in hindustani written by a l o e which i am obliged to read as part of my studies in the language they are stories with a moral and i don't see why something of the kind might not be published with health as a moral miss nightingale took great pains in collecting suitable raw material and during the remainder of lord dufferin's viceroyalty wrote to her by almost every mail four yet more was to be fired during lord dufferin's viceroyalty of sanitary shot supplied as he had requested by miss nightingale but we must now turn back to london where partly from circumstances and partly of necessity miss nightingale was presently engaged in a vigorous campaign there is a large bundle of correspondence during these years upon a matter which is referred to in some of the letters as the sutherland succession now dr sutherland was in miss nightingale's eyes the indispensable man not any longer in the personal sense as described in an earlier chapter for he was now a very old man and was only able to help her on rare occasions she had already found a successor in this personal sense or rather she had put dr sutherland's place into commission sir william wedderburn was during these later years her most constant collaborator in indian matters and for the rest she relied upon sir douglas galton she had often chafed at dr sutherland's delays but i expect that when sir douglas succeeded to him she may in one respect have parodied to herself the well-known cambridge epigram and said poor dr sutherland we never felt his loss before 
for sir douglas galton though devoted also to miss nightingale's service was an exceedingly busy and much travelling man and she had to be content with the crumbs of his time as it was some time in the dark ages she wrote may thirteenth eighteen eighty seven since i saw you last my memory impaired by years cannot fix the date within a decade i seize the first day you kindly offer and again december three eighteen eighty nine i must take your leavings as beggars must not be choosers yes please your dog will see you to-morrow on your way from euston for as long as you can stop miss nightingale relied greatly on sir douglas galton's advice she had a very high opinion not only of his thorough knowledge of all sanitary subjects but of his sound judgment generally from the personal point of view then dr sutherland was gone already but in his official capacity he was still indispensable he was the mainspring of the system of sanitary administration both for the home army and for india which miss nightingale had built up he was the one paid working member and he was also the working brain of the army sanitary committee and it was to that committee that indian sanitary reports were referred but he was impatient to retire at any moment his health might become worse and he might send in his resignation before arrangements had been made for the appointment of a successor so long as he remained at his post no changes were likely to be made but if he retired it was very probable that no successor would be appointed and that the whole system would collapse that the heads of the army were ignorant of dr sutherland's services had been burnt in upon miss nightingale's mind a few years before in discussing some matter of army nursing with the minister of the day she had suggested the reference of it to dr sutherland who is he said the minister i have never heard of him at the india office it was much the same i don't think wrote a friend september eighth eighteen eighty six that this office in general appreciates the importance of those reviews of indian sanitary matters of which dr sutherland has been the real author hitherto the whole system would lapse he feared unless she was able to do something nor was this all the sanitary service in india itself was in danger the annexation of burma had made retrenchment necessary a finance committee was at work in recommending economies and miss nightingale received private information that the sanitary commissioners were marked down by the committee for destruction the whole edifice thus seemed to be crumbling this was what she had in her mind when in the jubilee retrospect quoted at the beginning of the chapter she said that the work of thirty years had all to be done again she turned with all her old energy to efforts commensurate to the threatened calamity in accordance with her usual method she first consulted many influential friends lord ripon amongst others and then acted with great energy she wrote a long statement to lord dufferin november five i have sent your letter in extenso he replied january eighteen eighteen eighty seven to the head of the finance committee you should understand that it does not at all follow because the committee recommend a thing that their recommendation will as a matter of course be accepted by the government on the contrary i will go most carefully into this question in which you naturally take so deep an interest and will be careful to have it thoroughly discussed in council by my colleagues with the advantage of having had your views placed before them a few months later came welcome news lord dufferin to miss nightingale simla august twenty eighteen eighty seven i write you a little line to tell you that the indian government have finally determined not to sanction the proposals of the finance commission for the abolition of the sanitary commissioners about which you were naturally alarmed there is no doubt that the finance commission was in a position to prove that these officers had been able to do very little owing to the unwillingness or rather the inability of the local authorities to supply funds 
and in some cases to their own listlessness and want of energy we are now however taking the question up and the result of the attack upon your protégés will be not their disappearance but their being compelled to give us the worth of the money we spend upon them i am also inviting all the local governments to put the whole subject of sanitation upon a more satisfactory footing and to establish a system of concerted action and a well worked out programme in accordance with which from year to year their operations are to be conducted i cannot say how grateful i am to sir harry verney for his kindness in writing me such interesting and pleasant letters in them he tells me from time to time i am afraid i cannot say of your well-being but of your unflagging energy in the pursuit of your noble and useful aims meanwhile miss nightingale had been busy with ministers at home in the latter half of eighteen eighty six lord salisbury's government was firmly seated and she received visits from the secretaries of state for india and for war lord cross and mr w h smith she found lord cross most sympathetic he saw her from time to time during following years and they had a good deal of correspondence to mr w h smith she paid her highest compliment in some ways he reminded her she said in her notes of sidney herbert superficially and in several of their real characteristics no two men could be more unlike but in certain respects mr smith resembled her ideal of a war minister he had a sincere concern for the welfare alike physical and moral of the soldiers and he showed a quick and industrious aptitude for administrative detail she saw mr smith several times and at his request had an interview with the chaplain-general it seemed as if the work which she had done with sidney herbert might be resumed with mr smith when there was a thunderclap from a clear sky lord randolph churchill resigned the ministry was for a while in confusion and miss nightingale in despair we are unlucky she wrote to sir douglas galton december twenty three as soon as we seem to have got hold of two secretaries of state this randolph goes out the cabinet will have to be remodelled and perhaps we shall lose our men all the more reason for doing something at once of her two men the one was taken the other left mr w h smith became first lord of the treasury but lord cross remained at the india office i am very sorry to give up the war office said mr smith to miss nightingale but i am told it is my duty and duty leaves no choice she begged him to indoctrinate his successor mr edward stanhope she was already acquainted with him and presently he came to see her it was with peculiar satisfaction that she presently heard of the government's intention to take a loan for four millions for the building of new barracks and the reconstruction of old ones this was a resumption of the work of sidney herbert thirty years after an early intimation of this policy made miss nightingale the more anxious about the fate of the army sanitary committee if the sanitary condition of the barracks was to be improved it was all important that a strong sanitary committee should be in existence to supervise the work at first however she had been unable to secure any promise about the sutherland succession the war office would not consider the matter until a vacancy occurred the india office would do nothing until it knew what the war office meant to do in eighteen eighty eight the long threatened thing happened dr sutherland resigned no successor was appointed the whole subject she was informed was under consideration and then under reconsideration ultimately mr stanhope after interviews with miss nightingale reconstituted the committee june eighteen ninety sir douglas galton remained upon it dr j marston was appointed paid member in succession to dr sutherland and miss nightingale's friend and ally surgeon-general j w cunningham formerly sanitary commissioner with the government of india was appointed as an indian expert her friend mr j j frederick retained his post as secretary to the committee 
the danger was overpassed five sanitary reports from india were still to be referred to the committee but miss nightingale and some of her friends thought that the time had come for an advance in india lord cross was so sympathetic that the occasion seemed opportune for reviving her former plea for a sanitary department in india which should be more directly executive sir henry cunningham married to a niece of sir harry verney had been in communication with her for some years he was a judge of the high court of calcutta and had taken an active part in the cause of sanitation in that city he now prepared a memorandum advocating a forward policy miss nightingale's ally on the india council sir henry yule prepared another which was so far approved by the secretary of state that he ordered it to be circulated in the office as the draft of a proposed dispatch to the government of india this draft was in fact the joint production of sir henry cunningham colonel yule and miss nightingale it went the rounds it was minuted on it was considered and reconsidered printed and reprinted sometimes the report to miss nightingale was that it would be adopted and sent at other times that it had been postponed for further revision recirculation and reconsideration ultimately it became in some sort out of date because the government of india took a step on its own motion in accordance with the intention which lord dufferin had already communicated to miss nightingale by resolution dated july twenty seventh eighteen eighty eight the government of india provided for the constitution of a sanitary board in every province which would not only advise the government and local authorities upon sanitary measures but would also be an executive agency the passages in which the latter point is insisted upon might have been written by miss nightingale herself lord dufferin's term of office was now drawing to a close he had proved himself an apt pupil of the governess of governors-general as on the voyage out he had promised to do her bidding so now on the voyage home he gave some account of his stewardship lord dufferin to miss nightingale s s kaiser one hind at sea december twenty sixth eighteen eighty eight we are now on our way home and are having a beautiful passage thanks to which we are all picking up wonderfully and shall arrive in europe quite rejuvenated this is merely a line to apologize for having sent you the report of a speech i made at calcutta recently i would not have troubled you with it were it not that on page fifteen i have tried to give a parting lift to sanitation my ladies go home at once but i alas am compelled to take up my business at rome so that i shall not get my holiday for another two or three months amongst the first persons whose hands i hope to come and kiss will be yours lord dufferin was succeeded by lord lansdowne who was introduced to miss nightingale by mr jowett she saw lord lansdowne twice before he left for india and they corresponded frequently on sanitary affairs he did much for us in every way is her comment on his viceroyalty six the constitution of the sanitary boards in india proceeded with due regard to the periods of indian cosmogony and miss nightingale watched their formation and their proceedings carefully putting in words of encouragement expostulation or reminder whenever and wherever an opportunity was offered or could be made it was soon apparent that the great obstacle to sanitary progress among the masses of india lay where perhaps for many generations it is still likely to lie in the immobility of immemorial custom especially in the villages education was making some slight impression but the force of passive resistance combined with lack of funds prevented the hope of any rapid or signal advance recognition of these factors now led miss nightingale to concentrate her efforts upon village sanitation and a scheme for combining the power of education with a financial expedient formed the motive for the last of her indian campaigns 
miss nightingale had been watching with the closest attention the bombay village sanitation bill a measure first projected in eighteen eighty seven she analyzed and criticized it and sent her views to lord cross at the india office and to lord lansdowne and lord Rie in india her main objection was to the exclusion from the scope of the bill of the smaller villages an exclusion which did not figure in the revised draft of eighteen eighty nine she wrote letters for circulation in india to native associations in explanation and support of village sanitation there was some slight stirring of indian opinion and miss nightingale's next concern was to give to it articulate expression in london the holding of an international congress of hygiene and demography in the autumn of eighteen ninety one furnished an opportunity sir douglas galton was chairman of the organizing committee of the congress so that there was no difficulty in arranging for an indian section miss nightingale then circularized the native association in bombay begging that representatives might be sent to the congress and papers be contributed by indian gentlemen this was done and miss nightingale interested herself greatly in the congress sir harry verney she wrote to sir douglas galton august one eighteen ninety one renews his invitations to claydon to the native indian delegates three or four at a time i have seen mr bonagri who seems to be acting for the other native gentlemen not yet come and asked him to manage this as is most suitable to these gentlemen i may hope to see them one by one if i am able to be there i have also seen of delegates sir william moore and dr payne and sir w wedderburn mr digby seems to be doing a great work do you remember that it is thirty years to-morrow since sidney herbert died the congress was opened by the prince of wales august ten whose speech on the occasion formed the text of many leading articles in the press people talked he said of preventable diseases but if preventable why not prevented it was however in the indian section that miss nightingale was most interested and she used it to promote her schemes the bombay village sanitation act was failing to produce the desired results because there were no funds definitely allocated to sanitation sanitary education was making some little progress but not enough in view of the poverty of indian villages to make it likely that additional taxation would be borne in these circumstances might not some portion of the existing taxation the village cesses be appropriated to sanitation as a first charge until the minimum of sanitation is completed until the cess of a particular village has been appropriated to it while typhoidal or choleraic disease is still prevalent should not the claims for any general purposes be postponed such was miss nightingale's case she had a memorandum drawn up embodying it in short form and canvassed for signatures to it among members of the indian section of the congress sir douglas galton sir george birdwood sir william guyer hunter sir william wedderburn dr corfield and dr poor were among those who signed it miss nightingale then forwarded the memorandum with a covering letter going more fully into the case to the secretary of state she wrote at the same time to the governor-general and to the governor of bombay lord cross received the communication very sympathetically and forwarded it at once april eighteen ninety two to the government of india lord lansdowne then circulated miss nightingale's dispatch among the local governments and during following years a formidable mass of printed papers accumulated reporting on the proposals made by miss nightingale relative to the better application of the proceeds of village cesses to the purposes of sanitation the official view though not unsympathetic to miss nightingale's object was opposed to her financial expedient it was thought that other purposes especially the improvement of roads etc had a claim prior to sanitation it seems clear wrote sir william wedderburn to her july seventh eighteen ninety three that you have most effectively drawn attention to the subject 
the official replies are what we might naturally expect but reading between the lines i think they admit the justice of our contention and have been impressed by your action perhaps this was to some extent the case you have most effectively drawn attention to the subject that was perhaps the main service which during these years miss nightingale rendered to the cause of indian sanitation certainly she was importunate in asking successive governors-general for reports of progress her importunity often caused them to jog the elbows of local governments and she may thus not unjustly be credited with such gradual progress as was made the final reply to miss nightingale's immediate suggestion was sent in a dispatch to the secretary of state mr fowler from the government of india in eighteen ninety four march twenty eight enclosing letters on her memorandum from the several local governments the government of india declined for various reasons to adopt her suggestion but admitting that something ought to be done considered that sanitation in its simplest form of a pure water supply and simple latrine arrangements should be regarded as having to some extent a claim on provincial revenues and it promised to press this claim upon local governments and administrations as opportunity offers a covering letter to miss nightingale from the secretary of state may ninth eighteen ninety four while informing her that mr fowler is disposed to accept the view taken by the government of india expressed the belief that india will benefit by the renewed attention which your action has caused to be given to the important subject of rural sanitary reform there are passages in some of the replies from local governments enclosed in the dispatch which bear out this belief miss nightingale on her own part was diligent in appeals to indian gentlemen to bestir themselves she had an ally at this time in sir william wilson hunter who in his fortnightly summary of indian affairs in the times sometimes enforced her points or called attention to her writings she had urged her friend to write a detailed description of the actual working of indian administration and this he did in eighteen ninety two the preface to his book was a dedicatory letter to miss nightingale in it he says that the book was written at her request describes its scope and thus concludes now that the work is done to whom can i more fitly dedicate it than to you dear miss nightingale to you whose life has been a long devotion to the stricken ones of the earth to you whose deep sympathy with the peoples of india no years of suffering or of sickness are able to abate in her own pieces written at this date miss nightingale preached more especially the gospel of health missionaries for rural india some reference to progress made in this respect will be found in a later chapter she believed in state action but no less in self-help and this point of view is emphasized in a retrospect of her work for india which she wrote or partly wrote probably as hints for some vernacular publication in eighteen eighty nine some passages from the document here rearranged may fitly close this account of her later indian work miss nightingale saw in the queen's proclamation of eighteen fifty eight a text and a living principle to fulfil every englishman and englishwoman interested in india were bound in duty and in honour to do their utmost to help british subjects to understand the principle and to practise the life to this she has adhered through illness and overwork for thirty-one years first attracted to india by the vital necessity of health for two hundred or two hundred and fifty millions imperilled by sanitary ignorance apathy or neglect she believed it to be a fact that since the world began criminals have not destroyed more life and property than do epidemic diseases the result of well-known insanitary conditions every year in india the protection of life and property from preventable epidemics ranks next to protection from criminals as a responsibility of government if indeed it is not even higher in importance the first thing was to awaken the government this was done by the royal commission upon the sanitary state of the army in india 
which was the origin of practical action for the vast native population but the difficulties were enormous you must have the people on your side and the people alas did not care you cannot give health to the people against their wills as you can lock up people against their wills impressed by these facts miss nightingale saw the necessity of sanitary missionaries among the people of sanitary manuals and primers in the schools give me the schools of a country and i care not who makes its laws of sanitary publications of all kinds for man woman and child the sanitary commissioner in one instance at least has been a sanitary missionary crying out bestir yourselves gentlemen don't you see we are all dying the people must be awakened not to call on the goddess of epidemics but to call upon the surcar to do its part and also to bestir themselves to do theirs in the matter of cleanliness and pure water miss nightingale found in local government the only remedy in local government combined with education the paper touches also upon miss nightingale's interest in irrigation land tenure usury agriculture and in all these matters connects state action with self-help to the native gentlemen it is that miss nightingale appeals she appeals to them also on the sanitary point and first of all it is for them to influence their ladies let them lead in their own families in domestic sanitation then doubtless the lady will lead in general sanitation in india as she does in england another passage gives incidentally an autobiographical summary miss nightingale has deeply sympathized with the honourable efforts of the national congress which has now held three sessions in which its temperate support of political reforms has been no less remarkable for wisdom than for loyalty but her whole life has been given deliberately not for political but for social and administrative progress seven at the time when miss nightingale's indian work was thus largely concentrated upon village sanitation she was no less busily employed though in a different way upon work of a like kind at home her interest in local affairs at claydon has already been touched upon and this was much increased after the death of her sister in eighteen ninety lady verney had been a sufferer for many years but had borne her illness with unflagging spirit in may eighteen ninety she was in london very ill and was counting the hours to her removal to claydon but she would not give up a sunday in town a day which florence now kept sacred for her sister on sunday may four lady verney was carried into florence's room and the sisters did not see each other again on monday lady verney was moved to claydon and there a week later on florence's birthday she died you contributed more than any one wrote sir harry may fifteenth to what enjoyment of life was hers i have no comfort so great as to hold intercourse with you you and i were the objects of her tender love and her love for you was intense it was delightful to me to hear her speak of you and to see her face perhaps distorted with pain look happy when she thought of you miss nightingale at once went to claydon where she remained for several months sir harry now in his ninetieth year relied greatly upon his sister-in-law and for the remainder of his life she devoted herself to him with constant solicitude he was never happy if many days passed without sight of her or hearing from her the butler always put miss nightingale's letter on the top of his master's morning pile and no mouthful of breakfast was eaten till he had read it through when he was in the country and she in london he was always wanting to run up to town for the day to buy a new waistcoat or to consult his solicitor any excuse would serve so that he could see his sister-in-law in south street they used to say at claydon that there was a sure way of discovering whether sir harry found a new guest sympathetic or not if he did the conversation was invariably turned to miss nightingale 
upon the death of her sister clayton became miss nightingale's country home and she brought her managerial thoroughness into play there she looked into sir harry's affairs interested herself greatly in the estate inquired into the conditions of surrounding village life made acquaintance with local doctors these interests brought home to her the conviction that village sanitation was necessary to civilize england hardly less than india and she saw that as in india so in england education must be one at least of the civilizing agencies she set herself to make a beginning where her lot now happened to be cast in buckinghamshire the time was favourable to a new experiment county councils had been established by the act of eighteen eighty eight in eighteen eighty nine they were empowered to levy and expend money upon technical education by the local taxation act of eighteen ninety they received a windfall for the same purpose from what was known as the whisky money funds were thus available and the definition of technical education was wide why should not some of it be used for education in the science of health at home mr frederick verney was chairman of the technical education committee of north bucks and with miss nightingale as he said to inspire advise and guide the thing was done she was already as we have heard possessed by the idea of the district nurse as health missioner it now occurred to her to institute an order of health missioners as such the health officer for the district dr diath was first employed to train ladies for the work by means of lectures and classes the instruction was practical as well as theoretical for the doctor took his pupils with him to some of the villages introduced the ladies to the village mothers and pointed out particular matters in which knowledge sympathetically given might be invaluable to the cottagers an independent examination followed and the ladies who passed it satisfactorily were after a period of probation in practical work granted certificates as health missioners in which capacity some of them were engaged by the technical education committee to visit and lecture in the country villages the scheme started in the spring of eighteen ninety two was a simple one but it involved miss nightingale as huge bundles of documents attest in much labor for two or three years she enlisted recruits collected the best that was known and thought about simple sanitary instruction considered syllabuses and examination papers corresponded with other technical education committees wrote memoranda and letters on the subject to the women workers conference held at leeds in november eighteen ninety three she sent a paper dealing exhaustively with the whole subject of rural hygiene a paper which is unhappily by no means out of date to-day though the work in which miss nightingale was a pioneer has branched out in many directions we want duly qualified sanitary inspectors she wrote and she was delighted when she heard a few years later of the good work done by some women sanitary inspectors in the north full qualification practical training she insisted upon and then something else was wanted also her last word to the health missioner was the same as to the nurse the work that tells is the work of the skilful hand directed by the cool head and inspired by the loving heart the nurse's battle and health in the village continued parts three four five six and seven part seven chapter eight of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook part seven chapter eight mr jowett and other friends parts one and two let every dawn of morning be to you as the beginning of life and every setting sun be to you as its close 
then let every one of these short lives leave its sure record of some kindly thing done for others ruskin the last chapter was largely concerned with miss nightingale's activity in public affairs and with acquaintanceships which she formed in connection with them in such affairs she was forcible clear-sighted methodical sir bartle frere on first making her acquaintance had said to a friend that it was a great pleasure to meet such a good man of business as miss nightingale but she was many-sided and even in her converse with men or women on public affairs she was generally something more than a good man of business much of her influence was due to the fact that so many of those who first saw her as a matter of affairs became her friends and that to the qualities of a good man of business she added those of a richly sympathetic nature this aspect of miss nightingale's life and character has already been illustrated sufficiently in the case of her relations with matrons superintendents and nurses it may be discerned clearly enough too in the account of her official work with sidney herbert and other of her earlier allies but it was as marked in her later as in her earlier years and in relation to the men as to the women with whom she was brought into touch in reading her collection of letters from various doctors and officials of all sorts i have been struck many times with a quick change of atmosphere the correspondence begins on a formal note her correspondent will be pleased to make the acquaintance of a lady so justly esteemed etc etc the interview has taken place or a few letters have passed and then the note alters wives or sons or daughters have been to see her or kindly inquiries and messages have been sent and the correspondence becomes as between old family friends young and old alike felt the sympathetic touch of miss nightingale's manner the name of mr j j frederick has been mentioned in earlier pages he was a junior clerk in the war office when miss nightingale first made his acquaintance not many months had passed before she was helpfully interested both in his family and in various good works to which he devoted his spare time there is much correspondence during the years with which we were concerned in the last chapter with mr now sir robert morant at that time tutor in the royal family of siam miss nightingale had made his acquaintance before he left for siam and he came to see her when he was on leave in england leave apparently meaning she wrote september twenty fourth eighteen ninety one working on his siamese subjects twenty-three hours out of the twenty-four she became almost as much interested in siamese affairs as in those of india itself but the letters show that the public interest was combined with a personal and almost motherly affection mr j croft on the staff at st thomas's who had for many years been medical instructor to the nightingale probationers resigned that post in eighteen ninety two and in returning thanks for a testimonial described the pleasure he had found in working under so lovable and adorable a leader as miss nightingale colonel yule had first made miss nightingale's acquaintance in an official capacity as the member of the india council charged with sanitary affairs but he soon came to love her as a friend in eighteen eighty nine he was ill and wrote her a valedictory letter may two in which after giving advice about some official matters he said as long as i live but i am not counting on that as a long period it will be a happiness to think that i was brought into communication with you useless as i fear i have been in your great task in fact my strength had already begun to fail and so dear miss nightingale i take my leave let it be with the words of the fourth book of moses chapter six and those that come after us will put in your mouth those of job twenty nine 
his strength failed more rapidly and in his last illness he craved to know that miss nightingale had not forgotten him she sent a message of fervent gratitude i will look at it not as misapplied to myself he answered december seventeen a few days before his death but as part of the large and generous nature which you are ready to apply to others who little deserve it i praise god for the privilege of having known you i am sunk very low in strength and cannot write with my own hand so use that of one of my oldest and dearest friends god bless and keep you to the end as you have been for so many years a pillar in christ's kingdom of love and of this state of england ever with the deepest affection and veneration your faithful servant h yule the strength of her older friend and fellow-worker dr sutherland ebbed rapidly and he did not long survive his retirement he died in july eighteen ninety one he was in great weakness at the end and was hardly able to read or to speak but his wife said that she had received a letter from miss nightingale with messages for him to her surprise he roused himself once more read the letter through and said give her my love and blessing they were almost his last words two the affectionate sympathy which miss nightingale gave to her friends was not lacking to her relations in eighteen eighty nine one of the dearest of them her aunt may had died at the age of ninety one her husband the uncle sam of earlier chapters had died eight years before and the widow's bereavement seems to have done away with such estrangement as there had been between her and her niece they resumed their former affectionate correspondence on religious matters and miss nightingale was again the loving flow of earlier years dearest friend she wrote on the card sent with flowers when her aunt died lovely loving soul humble mind of high and holy thought miss nightingale was not one of those persons who keep their tact and kindly consideration for the outside world and think indolent indifference or rough candour good enough for the family circle i have been told a little anecdote which is instructive in this connection miss irby came into the garden hall at lea hurst one day fresh from an interview with miss nightingale i must tell you she said laughing to one of miss nightingale's younger cousins what florence has just said it's so like her she said to me i wonder whether r remembered to have that branch taken away that fell across the south drive i said i will ask her oh no said florence don't ask her that ask her whom she asked to take the branch away this is only a trifle but the method of the thing was very characteristic miss nightingale was a diplomatist in small affairs as in great she was careful not to run a risk of making mischief through intermediaries she took real trouble to that end and never seemed to find anything in this sort too much to do her influence with every member of her family was used to make relations between them better and more affectionate with many of the younger generation of her cousins and other kinsfolk she maintained affectionate relations she regulated her hours very strictly as we have heard but she found time especially in her later years to see some of these young friends repeatedly when she did not see them she liked to be informed of their comings and goings their doings and prospects their marriages and belongings she held in deep affection the memory of arthur hugh clough and she loved tenderly her cousin mr shore smith she entertained a generous solicitude for mr clough's family and the family of her cousin shore were especially close to her a little note to mrs shore smith one of hundreds illustrates incidentally miss nightingale's love of flowers and their insect friends ten south street april twenty four eighteen ninety four dearest i feel so anxious to know how you are thank you so much for your beautiful azaleas which have come out splendidly and the yellow tulips the smell of the azaleas reminds me so of embley on a tulip sat a poor little tiny tiny pretty little snail of a sort unknown to me he said 
i was so happy in my garden on my tulip and i was kidnapped into that horrid box and whatever am i to do so we carried him out and carefully put him among the shrubs in the boxes on the leads lilacs but my opinion is that he is very particular about his diet and that his opinion was that he could find nothing worthy of his acceptance there he must either have been drowned in the water-spout or dreed the penalty of being particular now i return to our brutality in letting you go without even partaking of baby's bottle my kindest regards to baby and its mamma ever your loving f n miss nightingale was godmother to mr and mrs hugh bonham carter's son malcolm with norman an indian civilian a younger son of mr henry bonham carter she kept up a correspondence she was much attached to miss edith bonham carter who had taken up nursing and there were several other relations who saw her and in whom she was much interested the number of family letters which she preserved is very large and among them those relating to the family into which her sister had married are almost as numerous as those relating to her own kith and kin for margaret lady verney in particular miss nightingale entertained a deep admiration and a most tender affection she was attached also to sir harry's younger son mr frederick verney who in these later years helped her in many of her undertakings and whom she in turn helped greatly in his a few of her own family letters covering a large space of time will best show the pleasantly affectionate terms now grave now gay on which she placed herself with her relations to mrs clough thirty five south street january two eighteen seventy three i lit upon the edition of byron without don juan which we wished for there are two volumes more than in our edition which may be trash but child harold the descriptions of greece in the tale poems chillon but above all manfred there is nothing like it in the world especially the last scene the spirit there is really a spirit the only spirit out of job and saul the ghost in hamlet is surely a very gross unpleasant dead alive unburied man with the most vulgar full-bodied sentiments clamouring for vengeance on his murderer not even so spirit-like as a dying man quite unlike what his son describes him a thief and impostor i am sure going to take the spoons manfred to my mind stands alone and is the most spiritual view of immortality of what hell and heaven really are of any poetry in the world one only wonders how byron ever wrote it to a niece who was going to college ten south street august twenty two eighteen eighty one my very dearest r aunt florence is filled with you and your going to girton i can say nothing i would in saying nothing i would ask those greatest of the heathens plato aeschylus thucydides to say much to you aeschylus whose prometheus is evidently a foreshadowing of or if you like it better the same type with osiris of egypt as christ the one who brought gifts to men who defied the powers that be the principalities and powers of evil who suffered for men in bringing them the best gifts the fire from heaven who could only give by suffering himself and who finally led captivity captive it seems to me that i see in nothing so much the history of god in the religions of the world which m mole learnt oriental languages to write as in these great heathens persian chinese indian greek also and latin too but specially aeschylus and plato and perhaps too in physiology the greatness of his work the silence of his work what spirit he is of his glory and poorness of spirit and that to be poor of spirit constitutes his glory if to be poor of spirit means utter unselfishness perfect freedom from self and from the very thought of self and from affectations and from vain glory my very dearest child fare you very well very very well is the deepest prayer of aunt florence to a niece who had taken up vegetarianism 
ten south street november eight eighteen eighty seven dearest i send you two vegetables in their shells we shall have some more fresh ones to-morrow a new potato is i assure you not a vegetable it is a mare's egg laid by her you know in a mare's nest no vegetarian would eat it i send you some egyptian lentils i have them every night for supper done in milk which i am not very fond of the delicious thing is lentil soup as made every day by an arab cook in egypt over a handful of fire not big enough to roast a mosquito ever your loving aunt florence to a niece who was full of the cooperative movement ten south street july fourteenth eighteen eighty eight dearest your cooperative usefulness is delightful if it is not in the lowest degree vulgar i should ask if i might give them some books but i suppose this is contrary to all cooperative principle lady ashburton has gone to marienbad to distribute bibles and tracts in czechish there is a very large cooperative estate about twenty miles distant on the borders of the forest which she has seen and believes to be entirely successful and i have charged her to send me home for you details and of course to prove its success you see how my manners and principles have been corrupted by you the youthful prophet if you observe aberration do not lay it at my door it is sad how youth corrupts old age your faithful and loving old cooperative aunt florence nightingale to mrs vaughan nash clayton house january three eighteen ninety five i have never thanked you except in my heart which is always for my beautiful book villari's history of florence its first two centuries it does look so interesting and i have always been interested in florentine history above all others i think it was from studying sismondi's republique italienne when i was a young girl book now despised you rascal and from knowing sismondi himself afterwards at geneva the end of this villari does look so very enthralling where he traces the causes of the decline and fall of the florentine republic its very wealth and commerce assisting its ruin and shows how its commune could not develop into a state that may help some reflections on indian village communities but i do not see that he shows though as i am reading backwards like the devil i may come to it how different were the florentine ideas of liberty from ours with them it was that everybody should have a share in governing everybody else with us that everybody should have the power of self-development without hurting anybody else i remember villari savonarola well it must have been published thirty or forty years ago i always had an enthusiasm for savonarola it was heavy learned impartial exhaustive it was my father's book he read it much i think i told you that i possessed copies of the last things that savonarola ever wrote commentaries on two psalms not a word against his enemies and persecutions or any mention of them or indeed any lamentation at all but all one long and fervent aspiration after a perfect reunion with the father of light and love good fenzi evelina galton's husband had these copies made for me from the originals in the palazzo vecchio to norman bonham carter ten south street august two eighteen ninety five you will see by the accounts of the general election how the conservatives have got in by an enormous majority and the liberals are discomfited but i am an old fogey and have been at this work for forty years and i have always found that the man who has the genius to know how to find details and the still greater genius of knowing how to apply them will win and party does not signify at all my masters that is sir robert peel's school never cared for place but always worked for both sides alike i learned the lesson of life from a little kitten of mine one of two the old cat comes in and says very cross i didn't ask you in here i like to have my missus to myself and he runs at them the bigger and handsomer kitten runs away but the littler one stands her ground and when the old enemy comes near enough kisses his nose and makes the peace that is the lesson of life to kiss one's enemy's nose always standing one's ground i am rather sorry for lord salisbury a majority is always in the wrong 
to lewis short nightingale ten south street december twenty one eighteen ninety six i have been thinking a great deal of what you said on both sides about a church at lee i wish you could consult some one not churchy like harry b c upon it what you say that if the church is to be done the proprietors and trustees of lee hurst should not set themselves against it is true the church is like the wesleyans another christian sect not to be put down on the other hand the church is now more like the scribes and pharisees than like christ the bishops and the high church look upon work among dissenters as work among the heathen they would upset all the present work in lee and holloway if they could christ would have laughed at the validity of orders difficulty of the present day he would have no dogma his dogmas were he tells us distinctly unselfishness love to god and our neighbour he takes the ten commandments to pieces and shows us the spirit of them without which they are nothing in the sermon on the mount he even ridicules sabbath observance what are now called the essential doctrines of the christian religion he does not even mention a high churchman and especially a h c h s wife would upset everything ever your loving aunt f to norman bonham carter august twenty seventh eighteen ninety seven i wish you god speed my dear friend india is a glorious field provided you keep out of little wars as you are not a military man there is just a chance that you may not have perverse views on this subject i see charlie sometimes he is a very good fellow though a military man but then his mind is not warped by frontier wars and i know at dublin he did a good deal for the men one of our nurses sister snodgrass who died just after she had gone out to foreign service was some years in dublin military fever wards she did so much for them and got many of her orderlies to reform their lives when they heard of her death they cried like children i know how hard worked you are so am i but your father helps me with his excellent judgment god bless you to lewis shore nightingale ten south street december twenty three eighteen ninety eight i send a small contribution to your journey i approve of switzerland but wish you could prick on to italy i always do if you make a bother about this bit of paper you will find that in the words of the immortal shakespeare ravens shall pick out your eyes and eagles eat the same i have the doctor coming this afternoon whom i dare not put off from considerations of the same nature if you are so good as to come please come at five for only half an hour that is till five thirty multiply such letters largely add to them letters of a like kind mutatis mutandis addressed to her children in the nursing world bring further into count her solicitude for servants and dependents and it will be seen how faithfully miss nightingale followed the words placed at the head of this chapter words which she had copied out as a new year's greeting for eighteen eighty nine she had a soft place in her heart even for criminals who despised rightfully used her in july eighteen ninety two burglary was committed in her house in south street it was in the early morning and she espied the burglar resting for a moment with his spoils some of her plate and her maid's money in a hiding-place behind the house if her maids or the police or both had been more alert the malefactor would have been arrested her sense for efficiency was outraged but she relented when the inspector came to see her perhaps it was just as well that you didn't catch the man she said with a twinkle for i am afraid you don't do them much good when you lock them up she was fond of the police and during the jubilee year admired from her window their handling of the crowds she noted the long hours made friends with the inspector at grosvenor gate and sent supplies of hot tea and cakes for his men End of part seven chapter eight mr jowett and other friends